Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Welcome back to Fading Memories. Thanks for joining me. I thought we might want to end this year, 2019, on a slightly positive, more fun note. This is a little bit different than some of the things that I've brought to you in the past, and I really hope you enjoy it. As regular listeners know, I have a pretty significant family history of cognitive decline on my maternal side. Instead of putting my head in the sand, I actually do a lot of reading on healthy lifestyles and other things that they think might help prevent Alzheimer's. I have a lot of goals and things to do, so I need to stay healthy so I can accomplish them. At the start of 2010, I went on a weight loss journey to lower my risk of developing diabetes, which is very common on my dad's side of the family. Little did I know at the time how important this lifestyle change would be for my brain health. One thing I didn't have to change, thankfully, was what I drink. I've always been a tea person, and I don't plan to change that. I did start drinking more and more water as I did more and more exercise, which is important too. Tea and water are pretty much all I drink, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. In the past year, 2019, there has been a lot more research on the positive effects tea has on our brains and cognitive function. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, had the studies focused on green or herbal teas alone, they would have lost me. Nope, not a fan of either of those. Thankfully, there are lots of positive benefits in standard black tea. I can't begin to tell you how good that made me feel. I was reading, it was morning, looking at research, and drinking drinking my English breakfast tea. I was so happy, in fact, that I knew immediately I'd be doing an episode on the positive effects of tea on our brain health. So grab yourself a piping hot mug, or iced, because I love both, get comfy. We're going to go to a happy place when it comes to positive news for cognitive brain function. Tea has been growing in popularity, especially among those looking to boost their metabolism or anyone who wants a caffeine kick that doesn't revolve around Starbucks Java. Meanwhile, researchers have been exploring the possible benefits of tea for mental and cognitive health. Tea is a term that can be broadly applied to any infusion of herbs, fruit, flowers, or leaves. For the purpose of this conversation, I am focusing on the stuff that is made from the tea plant, the Camellia sinensis plant, if you want to get technical. So Camellia sinensis is a species of evergreen shrub or small tree whose leaves and leaf buds are used to produce tea. The word Camellia is part of the scientific designation for flowering. That's loosely translated, of course. Interestingly, tea tree oil comes from an entirely different species of plants. And fun fact, I used to use tea tree oil products all the time for my skin, but I'm older now, so I have to use vitamin E extracts, but that's an entirely different subject. White, green, yellow, oolong, dark, and black tea are all harvested from the same plant. They are just processed differently. The processing produces various levels of oxidation, which gives each tea its level of strength. The description of all the types of processing get pretty technical. So if you're interested, there's a link to the Wikipedia page in the show notes. Maybe it'll make more sense to you than it did to me. Bottom line, I like black and oolong teas lightly sweetened. I don't need all the details on how it's processed. Tea plants like to grow in a rich and moist growing conditions. They will grow into a tree if left undisturbed, but cultivated plants are pruned to waist height for ease of plucking. The health benefits of tea have been widely assumed for most of its history, but it wasn't until the last couple of years that significant research into these claims began. Past studies on the health benefits of tea have shown that the positive effects include mood improvement, and cardiovascular disease prevention. Let's keep in mind for a moment that what is good for our heart is also good for our brains. The connection between cardiovascular disease prevention seems really important to me. Now, 
we're gonna get a little bit scientific here, but hang with me and pause. Get some more tea if you need help staying focused. I boiled the sciency words down so we would all understand the research as much as possible. Now, caffeine is probably the best known brain booster found in tea. Its effects are almost instant. It is increased alertness, wakefulness, and attention. Tea also contains the amino acid L-theanine, which is more calming. This combination of caffeine and L-theanine only occurs naturally in tea. I found this pretty interesting to be honest. Two different compounds with opposite effects. Consuming this combination helps reduce mental fatigue while increasing reaction time and working memory. This is one reason that tea is the drink of choice for monks who need concentration and focus while settling down for a long meditation. Okay, now we're diving in a little more deeply in the science part here, but hang with me. Caffeine and L-theanine aren't the only compact compounds in tea that may boost brain function. There are other various catechins that exert a positive benefit as well. I looked up what catechin is because honestly, I had no idea. A catechin is a substance that helps protect cells from free radicals. Free radicals are unstable molecules that form during normal cell metabolism. They can build up and cause damage to other molecules. The function of T catechins is one reason T has also been studied in cancer research. I could have taken a huge deep dive into all the various diseases that are studied with tea, but for obvious reasons, I stuck to brain health. There is one specific catechin called theogallin. In combination with the L-theanine, found that its consumption helped improve attention. While improved focus and attention is great, how do researchers think tea can help prevent cognitive decline? So good question. Most of the studies I read all concluded that drinking tea regularly has a positive effect against age-related decline in brain function. Okay, we're gonna get a little technical again. Make sure you got your, your t caffeinated tea for you. Just to understand the research, I actually had to do more research on many of the terms. For the record, doing this is also good for my brain. It's called dynamic learning. I think we'll leave that subject for another episode though. The main studies on the effects of tea on reducing cognitive decline focus on the structure of the brain and how it's organized. Structure and organization work together to produce brain function. In other words, the organization of the brain structures work together for proper brain function. Maybe let me say that again, because it needs, needs a little thinking about sometimes. The organization of the brain's structure work together for proper brain function. Of course, I had to think about this for a moment. I'm very visual, which of course is why I'm in an audio medium, right? So once I puzzled out how brain organization and structure affect function, which I have to admit sounds way too much like a math problem for me, I came up with this analogy. I am a very organized person. When my office gets messy, I start to feel stressed. For me, messy equals disorganized and being disorganized makes it harder to get things done. If I have to look for my tea research, I'm not getting the tea episode written. Now, the disorganization has prevented me from the function of getting an episode written. Okay, we can take this analogy a step further. I'm disorganized now, which is preventing me from completing my necessary functions, which is making me upset. So I toss all the papers in my office everywhere, searching for my tea research, and now the lack of organization has affected the structure and functionality of my office. I can't do other things because I made a big mess. The mess in this analogy is how my brain would be structured physically. So I hope that makes sense. It wasn't easy understanding the research into the research, but I tried my best. We all know that our brains have two halves. That's the structure. 
One study that was carried out for three years showed participants who drank either green, oolong, or black tea at least four times a week, heck, I do that at least four times a day, for about 25 years, had brain regions that were interconnected in a more efficient way. The study authors had a different analogy than mine, but maybe easier to understand. Of course, I read theirs after coming up with mine. <laughs> Go figure. Let's use a road, road traffic as our analogy. Brain regions are our destinations, while the connections between the regions are roads. So for my husband, that would be the house, the office, and the Safeway or the grocery store. When a road system is better organized, the movement of vehicles is more efficient and uses less resources. And the less resources is kind of important. When the connections between brain regions are more structured, information processing can be performed more efficiently. Have you guys ever been tired and you're like, word is going around in there and it just won't pop out? And you know the word and you know your mind is fine you're just tired so your efficiency in processing information is is decreased because you are tired so i hope that helps too so the study which was performed at the department of psychological medicine at the nus yong lu lin school of medicine in singapore showed that tea drinkers had better cognitive function as compared to non-tea drinkers yay us Current results of the same study support the findings by showing that the positive effects of regular tea drinking are all the result of improved brain organization brought about by preventing disruption to interregional connections. Let me say that one again. <laughs> it gets a little complicated. The positive effects of regular tea drinking are the result of improved brain organization brought about by preventing disruption to interregional connections. Okay, other studies have shown the same or similar results, and that's important. One from the journal Aging described the results as a greater efficiency of functional and structural connectivities among the brain's regions. They also observed less asymmetry in the structural connections between the hemispheres. So if your left and right side aren't equal in size, you probably got a little bit of a problem. This seems to reflect a younger cognitive age and possible slowing of cognitive decline. So, poop, edit, edit, edit. Other studies have shown the same or similar results, and that's important. One from the journal Aging described the results as a greater efficiency of functional and structural connectivities among the brain's regions. They also observed less asymmetry in the structural connections between the hemispheres. This seems to reflect a younger cognitive age and possible slowing of cognitive decline. Who doesn't want a younger brain? Efficiency refers to an easier and faster communication among your brain regions, essentially giving you a snap of your brain. Non-tea drinkers showed a leftward asymmetry of brain connectivity, falling, falling into a structural pattern that is more commonly associated with an aging brain. Suppressing this leftward asymmetry in structural connectivity suggests that tea intake could slow age-related alterations, and maintain a structural pattern more similar to that of a middle-aged person. There was one downside to their research, however. While the research did observe an efficiency increase in both structural and functional connectivity, this doesn't necessarily translate to an overall enhanced function connectivity between the two hemispheres. So what that means, drinking tea, isn't going to make you smarter. It'll just help you maintain the smarts you already have. And I can live with that. Starting a tea drinking habit can be a good way to not only benefit from previously reported health benefits like cardiovascular and mood improvements, but could also potentially slow age-related cognitive decline. So 
That sounds like some pretty good uh, reasons to drink tea, in my opinion. If you need to be focused, alert, and have quick reaction times, maintain short-term memory, accurately process information, and you want to be in a good mood, drink a few cups of tea. It appears to be a better choice than coffee. If, of course, you want over the lifetime to maintain cognitive functions at their highest potential, you want to retain a good memory and possibly benefit from the metabolic related health issues, then tea should be a daily choice. Until that day, I stumbled on the first article on the brain health benefits of tea. I didn't even know all this research was taking place. Since I've been a tea drinker my entire adult life, I hope their findings are accurate. Now that we've learned how beneficial tea can be, I think it's important for you to understand all you can about tea. Now, I'm known as the tea snob in our family. Mom used to tell me that I couldn't taste the difference between tea made from boiled water or tea made from water heated to hmm, near boiling in the microwave. Haha, <laughs> spoiler alert, I totally can. She even tried to fool me once by turning off the microwave before it beeped. Trust me, I still knew. Now maybe it's my British heritage, maybe it's because it's what I drink all day, every day, but regardless of the reason, there are proper ways to make tea and they do make a difference. We already discussed that tea is an infusion made from the dried leaves of a flowering evergreen plant called Camellia sinensis. China produces all the types of tea in the world, but many countries also grow the main varieties, including the United States, the main varieties of tea can be categorized into five major categories, black, oolong, herbal, green, and white tea. Now, herbal is technically not tea since it's not made from the Camellia sinensis or tea plant. It's also not going to have the combination of caffeine and L-theanine that seems to be important in cognitive health. And in my humble opinion, it tastes like boiled grass. So take that for what, how you want. You can stick with your basic black oolong and white teas, but if you're like me, you're going to want some variety. That's where blends come in. Tea blends are made by combining different teas or adding fruit, herbs, oils, or spices to a favorite variety like black. Some blends may end up with less caffeine because some of the tea is replaced with fruits, herbs, and spices. Makes sense. So like fine wine, teas vary by climate, geography, and farming practices. Having different blends is a benefit when you, tea is all you drink. I am not a fan of decaffeinated tea at all, but if I drink too many cups of regular tea, I can get an acidic stomach and that's no fun. I do try to balance out the tea with water because the tannic acids in tea can make your mouth and throat feel dry. So switching up tea and water keeps me feeling good all the way to bedtime. I have tried some blends that are strong. I drank some Scottish afternoon tea for a while and whoo, that blend is strong. I considered buying Irish breakfast as a regular switch up from my regular English breakfast, but reading the description convinced me I didn't need that strong a brew in the morning or probably ever. What I learned from the description is that teas have different grades. The grades are based on how broken versus whole the tea leaves are. The more broken the leaves, the faster the caffeine will be released in the water. Now, I didn't know this until recently. I learned about what they call a second brew, which is essentially reusing tea bags, and you thought that was just a little old lady thing. I find that two used tea bags make a good third cup of tea. And now I can taste that there's less caffeine, and my stomach definitely notices. But it's, you know, when you're on your third cup right after breakfast, it's probably a good idea to reduce the caffeine a little bit. I mostly do this in the winter since I don't consume a lot of hot tea in the summer. You know, Northern California gets hot here. So which is better, loose tea or bagged? Even though I am the family tea snob, it's my daughter who uses loose tea. I much prefer bags over loose or even the sachets. Now, I'm betting most of you didn't realize that there were three options. You probably only knew about loose and bags. Sachets are usually pyramid shaped and made from a silken material, which allows for full leaves and improved water flow, 
resulting in a very nice cup of tea. Tea bags are good for brewing on the fly. Each bag provides the ideal quantity for a mug and the broken leaves infuse faster than loose tea. Tea bags travel well and mean you can have a comforting cup whenever you, wherever you go. Fancy tea connoisseurs prefer loose tea because the leaves are smaller and the tea is more brisk. Large leaf black teas are more mellow and complex. This is probably something I'd get into if I had more time to appreciate the differences. I do have a fancy crystal teapot with a built-in infuser with holes so fine that you rarely get stray leaves in your mug. I do not like leaves in my mug, which is another reason I prefer bags or sachets. I get a consistent cup every time. The faster infusion time is also important to a busy podcaster like me. Okay, so now you've decided on your variety, if it's a blend or not, and whether you'll be using loose tea or bags, so let's get into some of the specific details on proper brewing. Don't nuke your tea. Just don't. These brewing tips are designed for the ideal cup of tea, but you'll get all the brain health benefits and enjoy the taste if you boil the water and brew your tea. Did I say that right? All the brewing tips are designed for an ideal cup of tea and you'll get all the brain health benefits and enjoy the taste more if you boil the water and brew your tea. Okay, I think that sounded better. You can also invest in an electric kettle with different settings. That's what I have, even though I drink black or oolong teas exclusively. There are two reasons for this. One, it turns itself off when it's done boiling, so you don't overboil your pot. My household managed to burn three teapots without whistles onto the stove, one for each one of us. So for years we had a pot with a pretty loud whistle, but it's a big house and sometimes I get distracted and the teapot's boiling, 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 and that's not smart. So hubby bought me this fancy electric kettle and it's got all the different settings, which are really cool. He also thought that he would use it to make his coffee in a French press because there's a setting for that on the kettle too. He did enjoy the improved flavor of his burnt bean water, but he had to make each cup individually and that got to be too tedious for him. If you don't have a fancy tea kettle, here are a few things to know about brewing the different varieties of tea. Now, white tea is the rarest and purest form of tea available. White tea is exceptionally delicate and refined because it's created from tea buds and very young leaves. The best white tea comes from the Fujian province in China or from Sri Lanka. It's probably not a great idea to boil your water completely for white tea. It's too hot for the delicate leaves. White tea should be brewed for three minutes in water that is 175 degrees Fahrenheit. I guess white tea is best for purists who are in a hurry. Like white tea, green tea is also brewed for three minutes at 175 degrees. Some Japanese green tea may taste better at cooler temperatures of around 140 degrees Fahrenheit or even cold brewed. I'm not a fan of green tea, but my daughter makes an excellent iced green and peppermint tea that's really refreshing in the summer heat. I believe it's three parts green and two parts peppermint, but it's a combination that you'd be best to experiment with so you can get your own perfect ideal flavor. If you like green tea, you might wanna try matcha, which is a powdered green tea. You mix the powdered tea with water that's between 160 and 170 degrees Fahrenheit and whisk it until it's frothy. Now, some companies sell flavored matcha teas that are brewed, or the proper word here is infused like other teas. Now, moving up the scale of body, the next variety is oolong. I like oolongs because they're only partially oxidized which gives them a lighter body with fragrant flavors of fruit or tropical flowers. There are two types of oolongs, lighter and darker. The lighter varieties should be brewed for three to four minutes at 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Darker or more oxidized oolongs should be brewed for three to four minutes in water that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I prefer oolongs in the afternoon sometimes because of the reduced caffeine it's less 
strong, so it's important not to give myself a sour stomach. And besides making sure I drink water, using a less robust body tea is a good option as well. Of course, my favorite is black tea. Plain or flavored, it's my go-to drink, either hot or iced. Even my iced tea starts with really hot water. I have an iced tea maker so I can go from no tea to a refreshing glass in less than 10 minutes. Now, I don't know for certain if the water is actually boiled completely, but I can tell you the steam that comes out of the tea basket is hot and you don't want to fool around with cleaning it until it cools down. Burned myself more than once. Temperature is obviously an important aspect of getting a really good brewed tea, which is why my mom's microwave trick never fooled me. Black teas range from mellow varieties from China to full-bodied teas from Assam, India. Black teas are withered, rolled, fully oxidized, and fried in an oven. This process creates warm and toasty flavors. Black teas should be brewed for five minutes at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you've completed the brew, you can serve your tea with milk or sugar. Now, personally, I prefer lightly sweetened tea, no milk. But after doing this research, I did try a little experiment and I've added a little splash of half and half to my afternoon tea of Victorian London Fog. It's got a pretty strong body and a flavor and the splash of milk actually brings out the spices. It gives it sort of a light, almost hot chocolate flavor without the super chocolatey, super milky combination. I don't know if that even makes any sense. My husband even liked it. So if you're curious, the Victorian London Fog is a blend of black tea, oolong tea, bergamot oil, lavender, and vanilla flavors. Now I think the half and half brings out the bergamot and vanilla flavors and kind of suppresses the other ones into a more mellow. It's really good. I was really surprised because putting milk in regular tea just makes me want to laugh at you. So lastly, there's a tea we haven't discussed, discussed much, and it's one that I have a difficult time pronouncing, obviously, and that is Darjeeling. Darjeeling's offer tropical notes without too much briskness. Darjeeling's come in a couple of varieties that need different brewing times. Now you guys can understand why I've got this fancy teapot. Besides, it was a Christmas present a couple years ago. The Darjeeling harvest runs from February to November and yields several flushes. A flush is when the plant develops new leaves. A first flush is light and clear. The leaves have a floral scent with a lively character. A second flush is darker with a stronger flavor. The tea leaves have purplish blooms and have a fruity taste in general. A first flush Darjeeling should be brewed for three to four minutes in water that is 175 degrees. A second flush Darjeeling should be brewed similar to a black tea for three to four minutes in water that is 212. So many options. It's like, where to start, right? Most beginners start with black teas. There are tons of blends to choose from. Some lean more sweet with notes of vanilla and lavender, while others lean more savory with flavors like the bergamot oil. Now, I get most of my teas from Harney and Sons, and even though I couldn't get a comment from them on this topic, I'm still a really good customer and I'll still give them a shout out. They have tons of varieties, blends, and each tea has a rating based on body, briskness, well, easy for me to say, briskness and aroma. They send samples with each order so you can try new things. And if you're interested in a specific tea, you can order a sample of that. If you want to give tea a try, I'd check out what they have to offer. You can start with something as light as a white tea or go really bold with a strong black tea. There is a flavor for everyone. And I know this because even my hubby who drinks Coffee, water, beer, and wine has actually found a couple of varieties that he likes fairly well. Now he hasn't gone so far as to actually switching to tea or actually having a full mug, you know, even occasionally, but he does admit 
that not all teas are bad. I guess I need to find one that is more similar to beer or wine to get him to switch. Maybe someday we can travel to some of the famous tea estates of the world and help them craft us this unique wine, tea, beer blend. <laughs> Sounds disgusting, actually. One last thing before I sign off for the week and for the year of 2019. In addition to the brain-boosting benefits of tea, there is also a brain-boosting benefit to chocolate. Now, now, <laughs> before you get all crazy excited, it's dark chocolate, and the higher the cacao percentage, the better. Now, I know someone who eats an ounce of almost pure cacao, which is really, really bitter. I made a orange sherbet from homegrown oranges because I was really desperately sick of eating oranges last year. And it called for shavings of really dark, high cacao content chocolate. On the, on the sherbet, it tasted fantastic. By itself, it tasted horrible. I like between the 62 and the 70% cacao because it's just sweet enough and an ounce is all you need. And I found the higher the quality of chocolate, the more that one measly ounce will actually satisfy you. I am a sugar person. I think you guys probably all know that. So if you're looking for easy ways to give yourself some healthy brain boosts while also preserving preserving your cognitive health, why not give tea and dark chocolate a try? I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? You have an enjoyable snack that has no health benefits, or you have an enjoyable snack that does have health benefits. I see no problem either way, but here's hoping that it's an enjoyable snack with health benefits. Until next time, pour yourself a nice hot mug of tea, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast, follow us on social media, and above all, take care of yourself.